their ancestors where their ancestors um worked and lived of course and there's um other people that are uh, interested in maps because they're undertaking local history projects on various different subjects um there are numerous types of maps that can give um additional information and uh, um to information that you've already found by doing family history in parish re records, um, in census returns, probate records. Um, so maps can then add value to the information that you've already found. So today I'm just going to mention um, some of the map resources we have at the National Library. Um, I'm just going to bri briefly mention them and where to find them on our website. And then I'll go on to um, detail um, a bit more detail about the Welsh tithe maps, uh, especially the online digital ones um, that you can access from afar. And then I'll uh, mention at the very end, just briefly, a few other additional resources that you may find useful when you've got information from tithe maps or other um, resources, family history resources as well. So the National Library of Wales map collection contains over 1.5 million sheets of maps, uh, charts and plans, as well as thousands of atlases in bound volumes. It is the largest collection of maps in Wales and it is one of the largest in the UK as well. Um, the collection contains a wide range of um, materials uh, from the latest electronic mapping um, back to 15th, 16th uh, century maps which are produced on vellum. We, the map collection at the library specialises of course in Welsh material but we do also have a large number of items covering uh, the rest of the world as well. And uh, the library aims to collect material from over all over Wales, or produced by uh, Welsh map makers. And um, there's a special interest in the rest of the British Isles and in other parts of the world where there are Welsh and Celtic connections um, in Brittany, for example, or in Patagonia, obviously. And while the library concentrates on collecting Welsh material, the aim is always has been to obtain a detailed coverage of the whole of, of the world um, as, as far as we can um, possibly. So as one of the six legal deposit libraries, we are entitled to receive a copy of every printed map and atlas published in the British Isles. And recent changes to the law that mean that we can extend this to electronic mapping as well, including data created by geological information systems as well. So this is some to give you some idea of, of the types of maps um, that the library uh, collects. Um, of course, the tithe maps and the apportionment schedules, ordnance survey maps, antiquarian maps and atlases, uh, railway and utility plans, mining plans, architectural drawings, nautical charts, estate maps and catalogues, and ordnance survey digital mapping um, is the most modern form of, of the maps we um, receive. And if you're interested in any of these, please visit our main catalogue, um, search uh, under the um, map section on the main website. And I've just put the link at the top of the slide here for you. You can also visit the discover and learn section on our website as well, um, where you can find a few digital collections um, of our, specifically uh, in this case for maps. Um, and these include maps of Wales, county maps, estate maps, town plans and others as well. Uh, but the main focus of, it, of the talk today is, of course, is the tithe maps. 
but it's it's always worth knowing where you can get additional information from and some people are very fascinated and interested in different types of maps and then of course you can go through them and um um just compare them and see how places have developed and uh, over the years So you may well ask, well, what were the tithes? Um, tithes were payments made from early times uh, for the support of the parish church and its clergy. And originally, these payments were made in kind. And that's where the word tithe comes from. Um, in, and um, it was a tenth of the yearly production or cultivation of um cultivating the the fields or stock rearing as well and there are three types of uh, tithe predial tithes um, which were crops of um, husbandry such as grain woodland and vegetables mixed tithes were products of animal husbandry so calves lambs wool and milk and personal tithes were profits of a man's labor uh, such as fishing or milling and these were um, very insignificant after 1549. It is more usual to refer to the tithes as great tithes and small tithes. The great tithes were known as the rectoral tithes and would be payable to the rector and generally comprise of the um, tithes of corn, grain, hay and wood, where the small tithes were known as the vicaral tithes paid um, to the vicar, of course, and these are comprised of all the different type of tithes. The ownership of the tithe was a property right that could be bought and sold or leased or mortgaged or assigned to others as people found fit. And the tithes were um, still payable in most English and Welsh parishes until 1836. And after much political, social and economic reform, there was an increased demand for the commutation of the tithe. And the Act received royal assent on the 13th of August in 1836. An Act to allow the substitution of money payment for payment in kind. So all the tithes that, that I just mentioned were then made defunct and uh, people had to pay the tithe equivalent in monetary form. Maps and schedules were created for each parish. Um, there were three copies made of each map and schedule. One was in one set is in the custody of the National Archives in Kew in London. The other set um, was originally in the parish. Um, Possibly they're still in the parish or they may have been transferred to local county archive offices by now. And the third set would be uh, held with the diocese office. And these were transferred to the National Library of Wales, um, I think it was during the 1950s, if I remember correctly. And so th it's this a set um, from the diocese that the National Library um, has been working on. So this is an example of a tithe map. And the accuracy of the maps depended on the skill of the local surveyors, um, which were employed to uh, map the different parishes. There were um, over 200 different surveyors working throughout Wales. And the most, uh, the first specification of the map um, proved to be very overambitious. Um, it was the assistant commissioner um, intended for the maps to be on a scale of three chains to an inch uh, with a standardized set of symbols. Um, for anybody wanting to know how much one chain is, it's equal to 66 feet in length or 22 yards. Um, but unfortunately, as I said, this was a bit over ambitious and it wasn't it adopted because the landowners had to pay the costs of the surveyors and many were unwilling 
uh, especially if they already had uh, detailed estate plans um, that would be sufficient for the job. So they didn't want to pay the price twice. And um, amending legislation had to be passed in 1837, <clears throat> permitting the presentation of less accurate maps. Um, often on smaller scales and in various different scales as well. Many of these maps were compiled from existing estate maps and involved very little new surveying. Those maps that met the standard were co called first class maps and they received a seal from the Tithe Commissioners. And um, the Tithe Commissioners uh, refused to give the seal on inferior plans and in Wales there's only about 50 of the 1091 plans that have um, received the seal of first class maps and these are mostly in the Monmouthshire and Breconshire area. The remainder were simply certified as being documents um, on which the tithe rent charge could be based and these second class maps vary in scale and quality. Uh, and there are them, some of them that were uh, actually um, to the scale of three chains to the inch as was originally requested. But um, we don't know the reason why these weren't sealed as first class maps. And others um, were more like topographical sketches and had very little value of information about property boundaries on them. And some of them were simply enlargements of the Ordnance Survey one inch to a mile maps, uh, which were mapped in um, the early 19th century. So the tithe apportionment schedules, um, they followed a more rigid formula and uh, usually set out on a, um, a form similar to what you can see on the screen here. And there were various different columns. The first one being for landowners, the name of the landowner, occupier, the number on the plan or um, on the map, the name and description of the land and premises, the state of cultivation, the area covered by uh, the land, and how much tithe was paid and the name of the tithe owners. Not all schedules are uniformly detailed. All give details of landowners and occupiers, but some give details of the holdings only and not of individual fields. And as you can see in this case, the state of cultivation um, wasn't listed either. Um, Field names and land use are most often recorded where the tithe documents are prepared from existing surveys. And you should always be cautious when looking at field names and land use um, because they uh, could be repeating information from an older estate map that where the landscape had already changed by the time of, of the um, um, the tithe surveys, so just be wary of that. And for anybody that um, wants detailed information, I'm no expert on maps, I must admit. I can give you a, a, enough information for family and local history wise, but if you want any in-depth information, this is the book that you need to go after. Um, by Robert Davis, The Tithe Maps of Wales. And it gives the background of the Tithe Survey and the Commutation Act. It details the agreements and awards, and uh, there's a comprehensive list of all the tithe maps by county. Um, and there's much more information um, in the book regarding uh, what scale every map was. <clears throat> and um, Anybody that's interested in mapping in Wales um, around the 1840s, uh, this is the one and only book uh, for consultation, really. So before I go on to show you the website um, where you can look at the digital copies of the tithe maps, I'm going to give you um, a bit of background information relating to the original project 
some of you may have heard um, quite a few years ago now. It's um, surprising how time flies. Um, oops. So it was known as the Canevin, the Tide Maps of Wales um, project. Um, the aim of the project was to digitize the Tide Maps of Wales. Um, and its um, full title was Canevin, Mapping Wales' Sense of Place. And it was a project run by um, the Archives Wales. So that's a cooperative or archive office, not county archives and university archives and also the National Library of Wales. Um, and its aim was to digitize 1300 maps, tithe maps, and transcribe over 36,000 um, apportionment documents and link them to relevant uh, locations on a map. The idea was to create an online resource which can be freely accessed um, to research tithe maps and the apportionments. Um, so a crowd uh, sourcing um, website has, uh, has been set up to allow anybody um, to contribute to the project and as you can see here there were well over seven, uh, 750 volunteers at one time um, transcribing and these were from all over the world not just local um, this was all done online As was soon found out, uh, many of the maps were in very poor condition and uh, as part of the project, conservation work had to be applied uh, to all the maps that needed it. And this uh, slide gives you some indication of the extensive conservation work on, uh, needed on some of these maps before any digitization work could take place. And the si size, um, the physical size and scale of some of these uh, very greatly. Um, this is very long when I'd, I'd say this one is probably about 10 foot long. Uh, I can't remember the size of the largest one, but it was pretty big. Um, once conservation work had been completed, and as I said, due to the scale and size of the maps, the library had to create a and build a specialist wall in order, in order to hang um, the maps uh, and to capture the map in one single image. Um, this slide shows the setup, which was very time consuming to put up every map, as, as I said, every map was um, different size and shape. Um, so this was a curved wall um, and the camera on the tripod in the, on, in the center there it worked from one side to the other um, and it captured the image and um, the, the wall had to be curved for some reason so they didn't get a distorted view of um, the, um, the map. I don't know how it worked but um, there was some reason behind it and of course they had to pin up these every single map and um, they were all different sizes and scales, so it was quite a laborious task at the time. So once the uh, transcribing had been done and all the digitizing had been done, the website was actually produced. Um, and um, this shows the tithe maps. The tithe maps themselves were produced during um, between 1838 and 1850 and um, are the most detailed maps of the period. And they cover about 95% of, of Wales. The apportionments accompanying each map uh, list the payable tithes and the names of landowners and occupiers. The land use, as I've mentioned, and in most cases, and we estimate about 75% um, of the maps include the field names as well. So the uh, link to this website is at the top of the slide. And you can search and discover uh, the Tide Map collection at the library by using this uh, geographic interface. 
It is currently centered around a map layer created from the tide maps to create a continuous map of Wales for the period around of the 1840s. An almost complete set of the tide maps of Wales is held at the National Library, um, as I mentioned, but any gaps in our uh, collection, we, um, we digitised maps from other collections from, from the National Archives in London or from a county archive office if they had um, maps to fill our uh, gaps. And um, you can search over 300,000 entries now from the website um, for, for different places and you can um, search the old maps and you can um, search for a modern place name as well and there is no registration for the website as with all national library of wales website they are free access um, and no registration or anything for them so you can re in um, access them from wherever you are in the world and you can search in various different ways you see this top box there it will give you uh, the option to search by parish name uh, occupier the landowner the name of the landover the farm name if you knew it um, a field name somebody was studying particular pasture or meadow or something like that they could put these kinds of words in there to see what what they uh, came up with um, and in the bottom search box, you can um, there's a drop down menu there. So you start typing a place name and it'll bring up the modern place name. Uh, so you can use the name of a village, a town or a city and then choose from the drop down list. Or on the right hand side, you can click on a map of a specific area and um, the next page would open up in that particular area. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, even if you don't have much interest in, in tithe maps as such, um, this is a very useful portal for using, um, for accessing any sort of maps relating to Wales, which I'll come on to a bit later. But it's um, it's a very good place where if you, you don't know where um, a place occurred, um, if you've got a modern name or an older place name, it's a good place to come and see, well, can I plot that on a map somewhere? So I'll show that a bit later. So once you've chosen your um, search here, if you could just search in, into the um, search boxes, the next page will come up like a satellite view. And I've first uh, chosen Colwyn Bay the Mochtre area because um, Sue sent me an inquiry last last week so I thought I'll use it a part of, of some of the slides. So it, um, if you choose a modern place name you come up with this satellite image and the tags um, you'll see uh, the yellow ones will tell you how many blue tags there are, um, it'll zoom in. So you click on the yellow tags and it'll zoom in. The same with the green tags. Um, they've got uh, lower numbers because they show up to uh, 10 uh, or 9, I think, and then they change to the yellow colour. So they zoom in at various different um, lenses. Um, but the blue tag uh, indicates a location on the tide map. And um, you can change the type of map on the right hand side. And down the left hand side, you can filter your research further. So you may have put in the name of a house. And of course, there will be numerous different uh, um, results for that house um, throughout Wales. Then you can narrow down by county, by parish by land use again, or by the name of the land owner or occupier. So to narrow down your searches, use the filters on the um, left hand side. And then we'll go on to look at the um, box on the right hand side. 
and um, you can change the satellite to a modern map if you want. And then you can click on the tide map. If so, if you wanted to see the tide map overlay, uh, you can do that. Um, it's it's very useful to look at a modern map and then go back and put the tide map over it to see if a property existed in the 1840s. And this is very useful as well if you've got information from the 1841 census or the 1851 census and you want to try and find a place name. So the blue, when you zoom into the blue tags, if you click on a blue tag, uh, it gives you further information in the box. It'll give you the field number, the field name, if there was one, a land use, occupier, and the landowner. And by clicking view apportionment, it will open another window, giving you a digital image of the apportionment or giving you a digital image of the map. It depends on, on what you choose. The green tabs will tell you the number of blue tabs for that area, um, as I said previously. So we've moved in, we've probably clicked on the yellow tab, so we've moved in, zoomed in even closer. If I clicked on any of those green tabs, I would be zooming in even closer still and getting that number of blue tags underneath. And just to give you an idea of the modern map, how it would look. So the um, Mountain View Hotel is right in the middle of the site. And as I get, and um, once you look at these um, different areas, if you, on the right hand side, there's a box there, um, that's a tithe map overlay. And when you click on that, um, there's a slider there, which you can put a tithe map layer over the modern or the satellite map. Um, and then you can make it translucent by moving the slider so you can see one through the other, which is useful for um, seeing how an area developed and how the buildings occurred at different periods of time. So um, possibly, I'll get on to that so um in the next slide i think so this is the um nls 1888 1913 um version of the map nls is the national library of scotland they have digitized um, ordnance survey maps for the whole of the uk and if you're interested in any other mapping um, it's worth going to the National Library of Wales, uh, National Library of Scotland website, and their digitised um, map collection is quite extensive, um, not just for Wales but for other parts of the UK as well. So it's well worth a visit. If again you're interested in uh, in mapping in general or even um, in maps outside of Wales. <clears throat> So by um, clicking on the apportionment tab, as I said, it'll open a digi digital image. Um, and then you can see on the right now, we've got the tithe map overlay. So that's the slider I was talking about. So I don't know if you can just about see, possibly you can't see too well from the slide, uh, but you can just about see the um, tithe map over um, the Ordnance Survey map. Um, if you can see the yellow roadways, um, it's just visible there. But you can play around with a little slider to see um, what, what's possible. And the number on the map um, will correspond to information in the apportionment. So a landowner, occupier, possibly the name of the field or the property and the use of the land. And as I mentioned, these maps were mainly produced in the 1840s and are the earliest detailed maps in Wales. Place names on these early census returns of um, 1841 and 1851 can be very vague at times, and therefore you'll find a, an ancestor listed as a landowner or an occupier. Um, you may find the, the property name 
by looking at the tithe map, um, but it, the property name may not appear on the 1841 or 1851 um, as place names are uh, can be very scarce, especially in 1841. And it's um, possibly as well, this is the first time you will come across a landowner, which is part of a, a an estate. Um, so if they didn't, uh, the land occupier, if they didn't own the property, you find out who owned the property, and then you can go and look to see um, at the National Library of Wales or an archive office um, to see are, are there any estate papers relating to that property or um, property owner. Um, and you may come across rental books and um, title deeds and stuff like that that may be relevant as well. And of course, you can uh, look at property names um, in the census returns as well, or in other documents, parish registers, um, probate records. So, um, yes, as I was saying, the numbers on the maps, on the tithe maps, then correspond to the actual numbers in the apportionments. Um, and it's always worth checking the digital image just to make sure that the information is correct. And just to have a, have a look at to see what the names of the properties and the names of the fields are. Um, and to see if there's any other relevant page, people on the pages. Um, you may find some other ancestors, especially if you've got um, an unusual surname. Um, you can just browse through them from one page to another. As I mentioned in the beginning, many of the tithe maps were based on already available estate maps and surveys. Um, and the National Library of Wales has a large and important collection of um, manuscript estate maps uh, relating to Wales, of course. And these range from the early 16th century to the 20th century and beyond. And this term estate map is used for a whole range of plans showing a single property to depicting the entire lands of um, a large estate. And uh, these maps are usually commissioned by landowners and were created for private use by commercial surveyors as well. Many of the estate plans are large scales and are very detailed, uh, some even showing individual trees. But in other cases, um, they are very rough sketches um, on the little bit of piece of paper in pencil or ink and were just used for everyday work. Many of the maps have accompanying uh, schedules uh, or telliers and they um, include uh, detailed acreage, land use, field names, tenants, similar to the tide map apportionment. So that's why the landowners were very keen to use these instead of paying for additional surveys. Um, this example here is very much like a tithe map. Um, this is one page um, from a, a series of estate uh, map volumes, actually, from a very local estate in Aberystwyth. So it just gives you some sort of idea of what you can expect by looking further um, once you, if you find that a property you're interested in was part of an estate, you can get, then go on to look at um, earlier or even later estate maps and plans to see um, if there are any available and where they've survived. Um, this is another estate plan. Um, these maps are a valuable source again, not only for the study of the estates themselves, but also of the landscape history, boundary studies, and of course, family and local history and history of buildings as well. And many of these maps are held under the names of the great estates and land owners of Wales. Um, one of the biggest in South Wales is Tredega, there are many more throughout Wales and some of these landed estates hold property throughout Wales as well. Um, there's a large estate in Upper West Castle in 
mid Wales. We've got smaller estates around um, Aberystwyth area, the Nanteos estate, the Crossroad estate, um, the Butte estate again in, in South Wales. They had property around the Cardiff area, around the, all the South Wales coast, but also in the Isle of Butte in Scotland as well. So you never know where you're going to can find information. <clears throat> um, the maps um, are the are kept uh, separate from the archival collections for these estate maps because it, the easiest to store store maps together, of course. Um, <clears throat> and the um, collections from estates can actually contain architectural drawings as well and um, plans relating to railways and mines that were on their properties as well. Um, and there were also printed maps in the collection, um, ordnance survey maps, and also um, manuscript maps as well, or annotated ordnance surveys where um, people have annotated um, estate information onto ordnance survey maps. Estate maps are a part of a wider picture of the rural landscape of Wales and its history. Early estate maps show the beginning of a process of change in the post-medieval and post-reformation of Wales. And as land ownership began to be concentrated in the hands of the larger um, landowners, tide maps and apportionments were very much part of this process. And towards the end of the 19th century, some of these large estates were broken up with um, tenements being sold off for auction. And as a result, maps and plans and sale catalogues were created. And many of those have found their way to the county archive offices and the National Library of Wales. And again, searching our catalogues and the archive office catalogues um, would be recommended. The sale catalogues are mostly textual documents, but they also have uh, accompanying maps very often, either loose or bound as a part of a catalogue. Uh, for this reason, they have become part of the map collection rather than the archival collection. Um, and it should be noted that some of these sale catalogues are in parts of other collections as well, possibly solicitors records is another place to look for them or in personal collections as well. Um, sale catalogues are ephemeral by nature and would very often be discarded after an auction. So if um, one has survived that is relevant to, to the area you're looking for, um, you could be very lucky. Um, they can be of great historical value because they provide detailed descriptions of um, properties and how they were divided up into different lots. And very often it tells you uh, the name of um, the tenant at the time. Um, and very often they'd been annotated with um, the name of the buyer and how much they paid for the property. Um, and of course, boundary information as well is um, very uh, often included. You'll see on this one on the right hand side here, it tells you who owns the properties um, around this particular lot in the sale. Much of the material deals with the sale of individual farms and small holdings. And of course, um, there are lots of catalogues for the larger estates as well. And the um, collection provides a valuable source of information again for those uh, studying landed estates in the 19th and 20th century and um, some of them actually detail some of the um, buildings as well on the property uh, including architectural information if somebody's um, looking at the um, history of a particular house um, or a farm um, some of the uh, catalogues uh, detail um, information about furnishings of the house and farm implements, the machinery um, that were offered for sale at the time. Again, um, these are documents that can be invaluable in studying the uh, social history of, of Wales. And uh, the library holds about 4,000 catalogues, sale catalogues. Um, 
mostly for um, Cardiganshire and Carmarthen and Glamorgan. But again, it's something that you could ask in the County Archive Office to see if they've got more localised sale catalogues as well. And you can search for the sale catalogues in the main catalogue of the library on the, on the website. <coughs> Excuse me. And these auctions and sales were frequently recorded in local newspapers, listing buyers and the prices paid by individuals. And this leads me on to the Welsh Newspapers Online resource. Um, again, another micro website provided by the National Library free of charge. Possibly many of you have already been using the Welsh Newspapers Online. Um, we can discover millions of articles on the library's rich resources of newspapers up to 1919. And um, you can get access to one and a half million pages of um, newsprint um, covering about 120 newspaper publications. Um, I won't go into much detail um, regarding the newspaper's website, other than there are two ways of dis uh, searching. Um, you can search on the right, left-hand side and you can browse on the right-hand side. And you can it's a free text search, so you can put, put a, um, a keyword into the search box. There's a drop-down menu uh, with an alphabetical list of all the publications. Um, and then you can choose the newspaper title and the date and the type of article you want. Um, you can click on a map um, on the browse side if you want a particular uh, region, or you can just browse the particular um, newspaper titles from the browse section. Uh, again, there'll be a drop down menu there. Um, and it's a fairly simple uh, website to navigate. And I would advise anybody to go and have a play if you haven't been playing already. So just to give you some example um, of the information that you can um, find once you're um, searching these newspapers, going back to the sale cap um, catalogues, this is an example of an extract from the report of the sale of a Glenarvon estate, the Llanbeblig, which is Carnarvon. Um, it was found in the North Wales Express in 1879. The estate was broken up by selling in lots and the newspaper reports tells us who bought each lot and what they paid for it. And you may find that um, an ancestor may be mentioned here or a buy as a buyer or someone of occupying a property at the po point of sale as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, yes, yeah, so they give a co fairly um, comprehensive and detailed um, reports of these uh, sales. So it's worth having a look. Um, putting an, um, an ancestor's name into the newspaper's website. And you never know what you might find. So that's a brief overview of um, the Tide Maps of Wales and some of the map resources and other associated resources that you can use um, on the National Library of Wales website. Um, hopefully I've inspired you to go and have a look um, and play around um, on some of our websites and um, do some additional digging if you haven't already been there. But if you do have any um, queries or questions, um, there are various ways of contacting us. I'm more are happy for you if, uh, to answer any questions now at the end, but if you um, think of anything after we leave, you can either contact us through these various different um, ways or you can contact me through um sue as well so okay so i'm gonna stop shit i will shall i i leave that up for a moment just to for you to get um note them down if necessary and um are there any questions stop sharing then and <laughs> There we are.
Uh, Jen. Um, is there any plan to digitize newspapers beyond 1912? 1919 is the cutoff point. 1919, okay. Yes, yeah. No, there isn't. It's a lack of funding, I'm afraid. And uh, I get that question every single time I do a presentation. <laughs> Unfortunately, there isn't at the moment. There's um, huge cutbacks at the National Library of Wales. And of course, it's just a matter of getting funding. Okay. So there's no plans at the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned 15th to 16th century maps produced yeah. on Gillen, I think you said. On vellum. Vellum, okay. Vellum, yeah. And what is that? What is vellum? Vellum is usually um, an animal skin. Right, okay. Yeah. Are they um, online at all? Some of them, are, um, in the, if you go to the digital exhibitions, um, all the maps that have been digitized are available through there or okay. if you search our catalog yeah okay okay thank you any other questions i have another question yeah um, that's fine your, your os maps that yeah. you have um how what are the earliest os maps when were they first produced the earliest um, OS maps um, are the surveyor's drawings and um, they were produced at the beginning of the 1800s. Okay. And then um, they were a scale of one to uh, two and a half miles, one inch to two and a half miles, if I remembered correctly. And then um, they... From the surveyor's drawings, the one inch to one mile maps were produced. And again, they were uh, probably about 1820s. Mm -hmm. um, so they weren't very detailed. Um, but the tithe maps are the most detailed maps then. So around the 1840s. And towards the 1860s, the first edition of the OS Ordnance Survey maps were created. So 1860s, 1870s. And then the second edition of Ordnance Survey maps were produced towards the end of the 19th um, century. And of course, we've had various different scales and um, editions in the 20th century as well. So if you go to the National Library of Scotland website, you can get different variations of ordnance survey maps. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from anybody? No, I guess not. No? No. Everybody's um, had Everybody too much information and trying to <laughs> absorb it all. Try to get it all down. Yes, so, I have one. Yes, yes? Sandy. Okay, um, I I am trying to track down um, the great grandfather who came from the White House in Abergwili, Carmarthenshire. Yeah. And I did find it on the current Google Maps. Yeah. And I did contact a regional bishop office um, to see if they could tell me who the current owner is because I'd like to visit there. Mm -hmm. um and they weren't forthcoming with any oh, information right. so um what what suggestion i mean it's it's very close to the town of carmarthen and it's very large it's a large property on the map so do you have any other ideas to find I the would, current owner um well current owner is just possibly google but um it's going to be very difficult um, I would contact the Carmarthen Archive Office. Oh, okay. Or the Carmarthen um, uh, Family History Society? The, the David Family David, History Society. David. Yes, yeah. yeah. The Carmarthen oh. branch of the, the David Family History Society, okay. just in case they've got some local information. Yeah. I'm not familiar with the area. Um, um, I I would do a Google search. You may come up with a telephone number or um. No, I haven't. 
Uh, no. One of the problems is is there is a B and B nearby. Yeah. Uh, I shouldn't say not nearby, but in the area, and um, I know that's not it because it's a small B and B. I wondered if I could get any information from the public library. Well, the Carmarthen Archives is in the same building as as the um, public library. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if they can give you some information from um uh well, we don't <laughs> produce telephone um directories anymore, but um they may have some electoral register that they can mm -hmm. give the name of the props. But if there's a bed and breakfast nearby, possibly contacting them to ask yeah. them. Mm -hmm. So um yeah. <clears throat> Tell them you're planning a visit and uh, yeah, yes. yeah. like stay there. And, um, <laughs> and wouldn't know. I like to book a room right now? <laughs> <laughs> they might yes. have yeah, the Devered Family History Society may have somebody local that has got local contacts um, that may be able to help you. Yeah. And uh, one more question. If, yeah. they, if a residence is noted, is that usually the name of the farm? On the tithe maps. Yeah, well, um, on a census. Um, I was checking, I think, the 1841 census. Okay, so yeah, they, they said, probably... They only uh, said the name, the name, and then it just said residence. Yeah, on the 1841, a lot of areas um, were very... Um, they had very uh, few addresses, as in the names of properties. So properties... Um, Households were in areas, um, so you you get very few, possibly a <laughs> far more house names, um, but you see those increasing to the 1851 census. The same as street names as well. We we lack street names in in most places in Wales during the 1841 and the 1851 census. Mm. Um, but again, you see see more details um, because population was growing as well. So we need to, to differentiate between different addresses. So that's where numbers on houses came and the names of properties. Um, you have to be very wary as well of um, properties uh, being built on the same grounds as another property or get uh, several properties with the same name. And you've got Ichav and Isav and Ganol, so um, upper, lower and middle. Uh, for the same farm name um yes yeah, so um the property if somebody's at the head of a household um he's probably living in the property uh, but doesn't necessarily mean that he owns the property right thank you um diane patak we have a question from you uh I, am i unmuted yes yeah that's fine um Maybe you already covered this, but if there's a small town of, say, a few thousand, is that equally covered in the maps that the early maps, say the ones before the Ordnance Survey or the Ordnance Survey from the, I think you said that was 1840s. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to get into specifics, but in um, Montgomery Shire, which is P-O-W-Y-S now, it uh what's the difference between that and and the other maps that focus more on farms uh, far, oh, well the farms are the detail there's detailed one um there's a for this period the 1840s there's very few areas of Wales that are very densely populated oh. um because it, it's the beginning of industrial industrialization in south wales so that's when the um, South Wales coast was being developed with coal mining, um, iron works, and uh, and so it was then that the um, the population of Swansea, Merthyr Tydfil, Cardiff, Newport was increasing. So other areas of Wales were um, not as densely populated um, at the time of the the tithe maps, and later, that's why the Ordnance Survey maps became a bit more detailed. Um, later in the 19th century because of industrialization and the growth in population. 
Yeah. Uh, so oh, oh, another so so in other words, the um what I think of as a town today was a very small place then. Yes, yes, yes. That there should there should be equal representation of maps. Um um okay. I, I didn't yes. I wasn't yeah. clear the on more that. populated areas were would tend to be mapped. But um if you're going out to the rural areas where uh, where um there were just hills and mountains, very often you'll find gaps in the mapping there because um there were very few inhabitants there. Oh, okay. But in a town of like I'm just guessing a thousand in, in the eighteen forties. Yeah. Then, so Newport was one of the examples I put up there. Newport is one that's been developed. And you can see by layering the different maps on how, how it's grown over a period. So there should be detailed maps then for, for a small a small town of a thousand. Okay. O only the tithe maps for this period. There won't oh. be Ordnance Survey. Ordnance Survey didn't come in until the 1860s. Right, right, right. Yeah, so. I can just add a comment that Lori and I discovered, and that is um, in Schlangefni, where my cousin lived, we discovered that her uncle lives in that same house. And although they have a street address now, the actual name has been retained by the gas company. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so as soon as I told her the name I had, she knew, she asked her uncle, oh, and he said, yeah. that, um, that was- Very often um, we have um, numbers on the street, on houses in streets, but very often you will find towards the end of the 19th century, 20th century, um, as well as a number, people have put um, names on houses as well. Uh, I have another question. Yeah. Um, in the early 1600s with the plantation of Northern Ireland, there were a number of Welsh that were brought to the by undertakers to different uh, <laughs> scattered places. One is Dungannon. And that's in County Tyrone. Is there any chance that there's any maps of some of these different that, as far as I know, the ones I know anyway, the Welch didn't own the land. It was owned by an English undertaker. But I just, I'm just curious, uh, more for Susan's uh, background than probably for mine. But I just wondered if there's any maps that are go back that early for the 1600s in. Northern Ireland? Uh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. You'd have to search our catalogue to see what's available, really. Or if failing that, if you want to send an inquiry to okay. the inquiry service, and we can get our maps at a specialist to have a look or advise you further. Oh, thanks. Okay. Be nice to know if there were Welsh that actually uh, owned land and Northern Ireland, so. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah, oh, thanks. Okay, okay. everybody, any other questions before we close this? No, okay. Well, thanks very much, Beryl, as usual. Wonderful. Diolch and Bauer. Bye-bye, 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 Beryl. Okay, terrific. <clears throat> I'm glad. I think we all got something out of that. You know, um, even if it was just the uh, the lay of the land with what they hold in in Aberystwyth in the university, and um, hope some of you can use that. Um, I know I I can. I've been looking for my parents and my grandparents in um, in Mochtra, near Colwyn Bay, um, and I can't find anything about it. Um, before 1841 census, but it's there already in 1841. Um, and I'd like just to find out how old it actually is. Um, can you use wanna... deeds? Deeds? Can, couldn't you use deeds? Um, I thought maybe I could. 
Yeah, make it a little more efficient and then you could sort of backtrack. Yes. Yeah. I will do that. Oh. Um, I wanted to mention to you all, um, and I know that some of you know this, but the the Heather Nine Mamgi, which is our grandmother's peace project, is currently being the petition of almost four hundred thousand Welsh women in uh, in a petition from nineteen twenty three, and brought over here. Actually, yesterday was the day one hundred years ago that the three ladies uh, are together in New York City um, uh, by ship from Liverpool brought the petition to the women of America. And if you don't know, if you want to know more about that, there's a whole story that we are um, telling and celebrating and remembering. Um, but the end result of, of our, all of our research into this story ha is, has culminated with the petition being back in Wales at the University of, um, of Wales in Aberystwyth, <clears throat> where Beryl works. And um, it has been scanned. The petition is seven miles long, um, almost 400,000 signatures and addresses. And it is being scanned and is being digitized. Um, there are many hundreds of people helping in this digitalization, the transcription of the petition. Um, so I'm going through my my family and I'm making a list of their married or well their name in 1923 the women um whether if they're married use their married name but I also make a note of their unmarried names obviously or even if they're married um their husband's name because sometimes they're Mrs John Hughes um and where they were living in 1923. Unfortunately, they have two, two or three great grandmothers who died right before 1923, unfortunately. Um, but I'm making a list of, of um, great aunts and cousins of my grandmothers, that sort of, that sort of um, stretch. Um, and we can look it up, we can look up the petition and find if they signed this petition. The petition was for, um, for it was a peace petition. It was after World War I when Wales and um, other countries had suffered huge losses um, uh, after World or during World War I. Um, and because of all these losses, um, people you know, obviously didn't want another world war. And Europe um, signed the Peace Treaty of Versailles um, to form the League of Nations, which was to help prevent world another world war. America um, had said that um, they didn't. Oh, thank you, Sandy. They didn't. Um, they signed the uh, Woodrow Wilson and his team did sign the PC of Versailles, but Congress did not ratify that. And so they never joined the League of Nations. Later on, they did form the United Nations, of course, but that was after World War II. Anyway, um, there's a whole story. And um, our grandmother's generation were the ones signing this. You had to be um, um, in Wales or or born in Wales, <clears throat> did not have to be Welsh speaking. Um, you didn't even have to be able to write. You could put an X and someone else would write your name. Um, <clears throat> we have stories of women who were in their hundreds, 102, 110 uh, years of age who wanted to make sure that they signed. Um, and it's just fascinating. Um, and if you're interested in finding out, um, you can start off by going to wcia.org. I think it's .org.uk, actually. Um, if you, let me just check this, that Sandy's put in the um, chat. 
Yeah, it's wcia.org.uk. If you could correct that in this in the in the chat, Sandy, and um, you can start there. And was, the story is there. Um, doesn't have a lot of our research on there yet. We, we've been researching the women themselves, the stories of the women themselves. One of them stayed in America, so we're particularly focusing on her um, and their journey within the United States, what they did when they were here, thanks to a diary that the one of them wrote. And um, so can you correct that again, Sandy? W-C-I-A. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the petition is going online um, as we speak. They're putting pages. They've done about four, almost 50,000 signatures already, but they've got a long way to go. Um, and some of us are helping with that transcription. Um so I just wanted to let you know that it is beginning to be up and online for you to search. And that's it on that. Is it dot or, or dot UK or slash UK? Uh, dot UK. W C I A dot org dot UK. Another oops. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get it right. So, so maybe you can mention the the March 9th event in Kansas City? Yes, the National World War I Museum is hosting us um, to, um, because it's Women's Month as well, um, ho hosting um, this project um, on the weekend of March 8th to 8th, 9th, 10th, something like that. Um, the, the Zoom link hasn't been published yet, but I will pass it around as soon as they do release that. Um, and they will have um, a celebration of this event. And also the, Wel the Welsh American Choir will sing at that event. So some of the stories will be told and there are um, three, two or three women from Wales will be on Zoom at that event too. And one of our team will be there in person and one of our team in the U.S. will be on Zoom as well. So is the recording of the event that you had a few weeks ago been posted on your website? It has. Um, oh, okay. So everyone should check that. It was excellent. 